today says it's the second in the series. So there is a series. Um, um, it's on demand, so that the first session is on demand. You can pick that up on the uh, on the Concepcio website. So more than welcome to go and have a listen to that. Um, some really interesting stuff. Today's session is focused on still industry 5.0. Uh, that's the series focus. Um, today's really about sustainability, capturing that product life cycle data and the product carbon footprint. And we've got special guest today, GS1 UK, and we'll explain why and, and why that why that's relevant. So we all probably know, and if we don't, we should do. There's a lot of upcoming EU regulations around the digital product passport. So that DD, DPP. It's kind of in that, you know, it's in the conversation now. People are talking about it, but maybe not quite sure what the impact is or what that's going to mean um, or, or requirements within their business. It's all about tracking that data, which and some of the questions I was asking is it's, it's very complex. It looks very complex. And the guys, what they're going to do is, is to hopefully show you some light at the end of the tunnel of how you can reduce that complexity and actually make things a little bit easier. And the big takeaway I got in the early bit was if you don't start now, it's it's going to get more complex. So if the things you're doing now will make the whole journey a, a lot easier. So our contributors today, before I get off on a big um, presentation myself, Joanne and Tom from Concetsu. And, you know, those folks um, are already supporting companies on that carbon footprint journey, you know, smart tracking systems delivering solutions to businesses today through that equipment and products lifecycle piece. So that's the good news. We're already doing this stuff. And we're super pleased to have Rachel join us, Rachel Heaton from, from GS1 UK. Rachel brings 20 plus years. I can't believe it. Looking at us 20 plus years. I mean, that's clearly a lie. You must have started when you were 12. Um, but from that construction of facilities management industry and explain how those unique identifiers will help industries comply with these new regulations and enhance those sustainability efforts. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. It's all very heavy stuff. Um, quick Q&A at the end. We're going to kick things off now. Um, I've, I've had a brief glimpse, some really good insights there. There's an awful lot more information available. Rachel talked about having kind of more resources available. So if anybody wants more resources or kind of it piques their interest, you know, get in contact with the guys at Concepcio and we can make those available to you after the session. But Joanne, I'm going to pass, pass it over to you now, if that's okay. Yes, yes, no problem, David. Thank you. So now that I've got you, right, I'm going to hijack you a little bit. So you're going to tell us, uh, you know, got a lot of detail to go through, but why, just because Rachel's on, why did Concepcio align with GS1 as a standard when many organizations, and I can't believe they haven't heard of it, but many organizations may not be aware of it? That's a very good question, David. Um, and I think from the very outset, so Concepcio is eight years old, right? Um, so we're still quite a young company. Yeah. Um, but even before we formed Concepcio, so Jackie and I are co-founders back in our Hewlett Packard days, whenever we were working on large um, complex digital transformation um, solutions we were involved with GS1 but it was specifically in the healthcare arena and it was in agriculture and food production so we were aware of GS1 the organization and the standards back then and we knew that whenever we moved in and we were creating our um, our platform and our visualization platform for our customers is that you needed to have that unique identification because you needed something that would have that traceability you know from whenever we talk about cradle to grave in relation to your asset and particularly for us so we have worked in very diverse um projects and i'm not going to go into the wall today but you know um aligning through um you know part production orthopedic kits um, looking at transport, looking at vehicles, um, looking at artifacts in museums, actually, um, and looking at, um, I suppose, prefabrication and concrete, so and, and lots of others along the way. But yeah. I, I think that for us, each and every one of those projects has something that is an asset that is a physical thing. 
that we are um, connecting to and we're aggregating data and we're visualizing that to make our customers' jobs a little bit easier. It's all about having a single point and a single visualization. And I think that from the outset, um, we made sure that our, our platform was GS1 um, compliant. Um, and the first project that we, we did this in was actually um, in healthcare, um, both in Belfast and then um, secondly in Wales. And it was about traceability of critical medical devices in emergency care um, and the viability of those products and the servicing of those products and also the recall of those products. But then from, from then, it's actually been in, in so many different industries that we've utilized it. Um, so we've been a partner um, with GS1 for eight years, but I, have, I haven't actually met Rachel until recently and delighted to have her on the call with um, Tom and myself today because it's a big part of our business. And I think for our customers, they really get it. They understand that, you know, unique identification. Um, and I'm not going to steal any more of Rachel Stunder because she's, she's a lot to talk about. Um, but just in relation to um, Consetsu and, and what we do and why it's relevant to the audience today is that, you know, we have our um, IoT platform and what we do is we connect to customers' um, assets, whether it's inventory, whether it's, um, you know, things that are going to be a picking list, um, whether it's, you know, pre-production, quality check and tracing of of part production on parts throughout a process um, and then also into, I suppose, from a shipping and logistics perspective. So we're connecting, we're tracking um, to help our customers understand their assets and flows. And we do this in a really simple way. So think of Google Maps for your own organization, um, bringing it to life. Um, so we use digital mapping and insights to help drive efficiency. Um, and also, by the way, reducing cost. But what we have recently been doing within the business and why we're running this series of webinars is that we're not only helping with that production efficiency and visualization and understanding where some of the pain points are and managing that, but we're also now able to automatically help um, and measure that carbon um, impact. And that's something that we're really excited about um, and something which the Smart Manufacturing Data Hub has enabled us to do. Um, but just just briefly then in relation to, you know, our last webinar um, was all around Industry 5.0 and how we're utilising sensors and technology to help drive that visualisation and capture data. But today we're really talking about, you know, that sustainability footprint and how we can help our customers, um, you know, reduce their carbon impact. But there's loads, you, you mentioned before, there is so many acronyms, you know, DPP, Digital Product pa Passport, LCA, Lifecycle Analysis, Product Carbon Footprint. Um, you name it. There's a lot of acronyms out there, but we can really distill that down for our customers. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. So in relation to, um, you know, the life cycle analysis, I think that what we are finding is that that is a system. It is not just a product. It's a whole process. It's about the environment. It's about the land in which things are being produced and, and that whole traceability and viability of a product. Um, in relation to, to many of our organizations, they're not really doing that full life cycle analysis, but what they are doing is looking at that product carbon footprint. Again, in relation to cradle to grave though, um, where they're really focused on understanding and capturing um, the greenhouse gas emissions and understanding their carbon impact as part of their production um, and understanding that and being able to report on that um, to either their customers or else who they're supplying their, their, their products into. Um, and I think that, you know, by utilizing some of the technology and combining those insights for us, we're able to help customers um, understand the environmental, environmental impact of their entire um, I suppose, process um, and be able to report on that. And if they are supplying that into another organization, you know, creating that scope three, which is very difficult for a lot of customers, is, is something that, um, you know, many people are, are, are looking at this technology to help to do. So if we if we look at some of the challenges, I think initially, um, and I just love this little gif about Excel because many of the customers that we go to see have many different systems, ERP, you know, various, various different um, asset management systems. But a lot of people have a lot of Excel, right? Um, and they've got independent people that have created macros. But if, if something happens with that macro and someone's not in the business, you know, you're, you're quite dependent on all of this, um, I suppose, disparate data that does reside at times in different systems and also can um, reside in Excel. But I think that what we're seeing in, in the world that we live in now, which is 
enabling our customers to do more with less by automating, you know, by utilizing sensors to capture this data and to visualize that to help, um, you know, with that improvement in productivity is that there's so much data, you know, so the data complexity, the volume, the velocity of that, you know, you just can't do it within Excel. Actually, even doing it in, in normal relational databases is, is, a, is a challenge. This data is often fragmented between different departments. Um, so, you know, it's more complex whenever you're trying to pull that together and understand your footprint. Um, also, the granularity of the data, you know, whenever we're talking about some of the projects here today, we're able to capture that automatically and we've got the granularity. Um, so it should meet those regulatory standards, by the way, which are which are still being defined. Um, and I think also it helps with time. So we're a small business and, and everything we do, like our greatest asset is time. And it's about how we can help customers do this in a more time effective um, way. And I think then just finally in relation to benchmarking and reporting, if we don't start somewhere with our baseline data and measure that, then it's very difficult to show how we're improving. And as a small business, we've started to do that. We've started to see some anomalies, let's say, in our own um, uh, uh, electricity usage, which we've now addressed. Um, but I think it's important to, to understand that. Um, so I'm not going to get into too much detail because Rachel's really going to take us through this in, in, in a very um, in a very high level way, but also bringing it to life, you know, and how GS1 is really relevant in relation to that. But I think for, for people um, on the call, we're, we're aware of uh, needing to understand our product carbon footprint in manufacturing. Digital product passport is coming down the line from the EU um, and mandatory by 2026, but only in a number of businesses, you know, um, in manufacturing and construction, um, battery and textiles, but actually in healthcare, you know, there's a big movement around some of that in relation to medical devices as well. So the elements in green, um, we're going to show you some of that later on. So I'll not get into too much detail there. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we're automatically capturing that through sensor data or aggregation, um, for, you know, from other system data as well. Um, but I think for, for me, I wanted to try and bring this to life in relation to a project. Um, so whenever we, we look at our customers, um, and, and particularly in the manufacturing space, um, concrete manufacturing in relation to carbon emissions, they are the bad boys, um, and hence why there has been a project that was established with Digital Catapult in London, um, you know, funded um, through the Made Smarter Innovation Programme, which is about trying to understand how one of the most complex, one of the most energy consuming um, and carbon emitting um, manufacturing processes could utilise some of this technology to help understand um, and measure you know, some of the elements of their carbon emission and then help reduce that. So this whole project was aligned against resource efficiency, which was then driving energy efficiency. Um, and if I look at it, you know, in relation to, to where we were with that project, you know, we're working in an environment that that is quite harsh, you know, but we are doing real time um, data collection um, and we are using sensors from design stage right through to quality in relation to understanding, um, you know, the pre-product, you know, whenever something's going through from a rebar fitting and, and molding, you know, the curing time and quality, and then also in the dispatch and being able to understand how long a product has been in a certain area, the movement of that product and the temperature. Um, and we're using, you know, um, I suppose receivers, let's call them, uh, Tom can talk about the technology later, that are strategically aligned in those areas to bring this to life for the customer and represent this all on a, a digital map so they can see that information from the CFO, head of production, right down into the people on the floor as well. Um, and that's giving that end-to-end -end visibility, you know, so being able to continuously monitor um, and understand that cycle time and dwell time. Because for, for many of our customers, it, it have I got the right product in the right place and the right resources in the right place at the right time to ensure that I don't have some blockage in relation to I don't have the right tool or I don't have the right person or you know something hasn't set as it were in, in, in this particular um, case. And we're automatically capturing all of that and presenting that to the customer to help manage that anomaly. And I think on the data side, what's been really interesting in this project is also being able to look at temperature, humidity during curing and understanding ambient temperature. Um, so, you know, concrete is, is using heat beds and using a lot of energy to help, you know, cure that product, which is something that we we all need. Um, but we're also then, you know, looking at how we can bring in sustainable data from air quality. So particulate matter, you know, some of these environments are harsh. 
um, and, and looking at some of the factors there around TVOC and things like that as well. Um, and for all of this, you know, there's there's no point in doing any of these projects, um, you know, unless there's a, a, a benefit to our customers in relation to either process improvement or, or reducing cost. And, and what we are finding is that having detailed tracking of ensuring you've got the right product in the right place at the right time um, does reduce idle time and does improve tack time for our customers. Um, and that is all helping as, as we're going to talk now a little bit about digital product passports. But within you know the construction industry, um, you've got the construction product readiness um, and you know being able to capture data for that. Um, but all the time we're trying to look at how we can be saving on cost in relation to resources, you know, not having to bring people in to meet a customer SLA because we've had the right product in the right resource at the right time um, and therefore not burning as much energy as, as we would do if we were running on a, a weekend, for example, and trying to reduce some of that for our customers. And I think then just finally, um, and Tom's going to talk about the data, it's where we aggregate that um, and how we bring that to life for our customers through very simple visualizations, but really help them on their day to day. Um, so for, for, for myself now, I'm, I'm going to hand over um, to uh, Rachel just to talk through the, uh, I suppose, why GS1 and why it is, I suppose, one of the key traceable metrics for um, customers, no matter what industry they're in today. But I think, you know, um, Rachel will, will, will talk a little bit about digital product passport, but it's and this is not just ourselves that are saying this. Obviously, you've got GS1, I'm going to talk about it today, but, you know, EU studies show that. Um, Cap Gem and I, we talk about that as well in relation to the fact that if we are able to introduce technology, it will help improve our carbon footprint, but also help in relation to our return on investment as well. Great. So, Rachel, I'll hand over to yourself. Thank you, Joanne. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so just briefly then, so who is GS1? Who's GS1? We are global and local. Basically, we're a standards membership organization, non-for-profit, and we have offices in over 118 countries. Um, and in GS1 UK's purpose, and our, our, our standard, our mission statement is that is really around powering the standards to transform the way people work and live. And what I mean by that is we collaborate with industry, not just construction, but all, all sectors, to make sure that everybody can work efficiently. So we've been solving industry's problems now for over 50 years. Um, and this is just a bit of a journey of where the barcode's been on that. And one thing to take away from today for your pop quiz in the pub is that the first barcode was scanned in 1974, and that was a Wrigley's chewing gum. And right down on the path, and I won't go through everything here today, but you can read that in your own time, is around where, where's the future going in this? And it's around um, QR codes, so GS1 powered by, um, uh, sorry, QR powered by GS1, and then digital product passports and where do we move forward with that? So everything that we do is built on standards. So, uh, and it goes from identification, identify, capture, share. And when I mean that, what do I mean by that? So what do we need to identify? So we need to identify people, places, products, assets. And these are just the four key, we have 12 different um, identification keys within GS1. And the four that I've got here on the screen today is the common ones that are most commonly used within construction. So the GTIN, which is the Global Trade Identification Number, that's the number that you find on any product, pretty much from retail all the way right through. Um, and then Global Location Numbers, so that's how do you identify spaces, particularly in hospitals and NHS at the moment. In the UK, that's where we're being used. Um, and GIAIs, that's also being used by KTRAC, our global identifier, um, and then um, SSCC. SSCC. Um, again, like Joanne said, too many acronyms within the whole of the construction, and we're just not making it any better. But these are our standards. Um, so GTIN, this is what you see. This is the barcode. This is how you define it. But a barcode is not just, you can actually have more data within that. So within a, a GS1 data matrix or in a QR code, you can actually create and put more data in there from a serial, serialization or batching and expiring. Um, so this is obviously used within retail as well. Capturing that data. So uh, barcodes we've mentioned, QR codes powered by GS1, where you can obviously have more data going in there and RFID tags and how you share that data by obviously EDI is most commonly used, but EPCIS as well. 
So just to reiterate, what we're focusing on at the moment is products, places, and assets. And this slide, although it looks like there's a lot of letters on here, this is really explaining to you that the GS1 standards can go throughout the whole product life cycle, right from raw material supply, right through to maintenance and repair, so end of life. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a, I'm not expecting you all to take all these in, but uh, this you can refer back to this. This is the complicated slide, not the slide before. This is the complicated slide because it is a complex landscape in manufacturing, in construction as a whole, and we need to be having consistent data. And unique identification is one of the ways to be able to do that. We've segregated this down and looked at different construction sectors as, and to make sure that we can talk about GS1 standards and include everybody within our conversations. But why now? And we've touched on this, Joanne's mentioned it earlier on. One of the things is because of legislation. It's about the supply chain, trust and transparency, sustainability, circularity, the list goes on. But ultimately we need to be uh, speak, all speaking the same way in the same language and data needs to be able to go through the whole life cycle. Building Safety Act has obviously just uh, just recently become a, apparent in the UK, um, and then within that, it talks around using QR codes, RFID tags to be able to track the products that we're putting into our buildings. Looking at from a digital transformation aspect, from physical to digital, and ensuring that we can put these standards within the BIM models. So briefly, what we've been asked to kind of look at around here is the future legislation and looking at the digital product passport. <clears throat> but we're, a part of that is, is the construction product regulations. And the construction product regulations is a separate regulation outside of the digital product passport. It's based on the digital product passport. And there's a little bit more to it from that. Digital product passport is a conceptually based on the Eco Design for Sustainability Products, so the ESPR, um, which came into force in July in 2024. But we're looking for the single market for construction products and ensuring that that is placed on products. And this is the time frame of what we're working to at the moment. So um, main focus is, is obviously the obligation to deliver a, pro a digital product passport, um, by 2028, which I think Joanne also mentioned earlier on in one of the slides. And then it is an ongoing um, an ongoing discussion. Uh, there's, gonna, there's a consortium, there's framework agreements, there's um, aspects that everybody's currently looking at at the moment. Um, but the time to obviously start thinking about it is now. But what do we know? What do we really know about the digital product passport? What do we know about what's required? Um, I think it was mentioned earlier on, it's not been defined as to what data is actually going to be needed to go into a digital product passport. Um, and it's been that clear because that's, that's what's still been um, discussed. That's still been what's been looked at. But I think the key things that we do know is that this is based on open standards. It needs to be machine readable um, and it's developed with uh, it needs to be structured data uh, and it needs to be able to ex exchange. So it has to be uh, interoperable which all of these factors is what GS1 standards can, can deliver and support to the table. And as a global organization, we are um, working with the EU Commission to discuss where GS1 standards could play a part and could fit with this. Um, and, and that's what we're currently doing at the moment. And we're also supporting in different um, consortiums. So this is just some um, some slides here. There is a video which um, I will send over after this. But just to kind of re reiterate, what is what is it? So it's just to make sure that our data is for sustainability, traceability, circularity, for legal compliance. And I think these are the things. It's about the whole product's journey and life cycle. So if those are the things that you want to take away from today. Then that's what you need to be looking for in the future. Um, so I will just send this over later. But again, just reiterating what we're looking for. So what could a digital product passport look like according to the construction product regulation? It needs to have unique identifiers. It needs to have data carriers, all of which I've just mentioned earlier on. Um, and it needs to be interoperable. 
So GS1 as a whole, we've looked at lots of different um, things about well, what can we do? How can we support the digital product passport? How can we support industry and what can we do? This slide here just gives us a bit of a, an idea um, and nothing has been defined, like I said, about what kind of products need to be, um, data needs to go into a digital product passport. But if you scan this logo here, um, we recently attended uh, Metals Expo and we worked with um, Tata Steel, uh, Katnik. Um, this is a steel lintel with our partner Earjet um, and they printed, um, etched on this QR code. Um, and it, you can see the digital information behind it. And this just gives you an idea that there is uh, the types of information you could put in there. So manufacturer details, product date template, um, EPD, um, all those type of really important things that are gonna be needed potentially within a digital product passport. I don't know um, the feedback from the audience, but hopefully everybody can see that and uh, scan that. Works. The good news is it works. <laughs> it works. This is good, David. This is good. Um, yeah. So we worked with um, Salford University to create this um, construction smart scan app just to kind of explain how that would look. Um, and then this is just the QR, which is a QR power by JS1. And just really just ending on this, because I'm conscious this is a lot of information in such a small amount of time. Um, but the one last thing I want to say is. Um, when I've mentioned QR Power by GS1, that is um, what we're looking at in the future. We're looking at, you know, potentially the linear barcode, what you see currently turning into this. This is a QR code with the same numbering underneath, with the GS1 logo, which will be hopefully going beep at the till by 2027. So I'll leave you with that thought. Great. Thank you, Rachel. That's perfect. Okay, so Tom's going to um, pop up a few slides now. So Tom's the pre-sales technical lead at Concepcio. So he gets all the, the address and stuff. He's the guy who helps sort out the requirements for customers to create that solution. So his main objectives are to remove, remove the difficulty from the customer side, building that into a solution that actually delivers results. So no pressure, Tom. Um, how does all this magic happen? <laughs> Thanks, David. Yes, so I suppose it's my role to essentially bring all this to life for a customer and remove all the complexity of designing these solutions so that they can focus on the outcome. Um, so I'll try and bring this to life today um, and talk through how we're currently utilizing technology um, and aligning that with DPP, but also you know delivering some results now. Um, so to begin with, I suppose I'll take you through, obviously Rachel talked about the advantages of QR codes over barcodes. Um, and here at Concepcio, we, we work, well, we work with all of them, but one of our, our core elements is utilizing RFID. Um, so some of the differences between RFID and barcodes, um, you know, so RFID is essentially a little computer chip um, inside a, a tag, and you can see it on the, on the right-hand side there um, with the orange background. And that allows us to store a lot more information about the product. So, you know, it allows us, it allows the user to build on that GS1 structure um, that, that Rachel talked about. Other benefits, um, you know, you, you can automatically capture RFID codes um, or RFID tags as they move through a process or through a facility. And, um, you know, if you have very um, strategically placed RFID readers, you can essentially watch the flow of assets as, as they move. Um, in terms of the durability of RFID tags, you know, there's a clear advantage there because there's no need for line of sight to an RFID tag. They can come in all shapes and sizes and be made of all kinds of materials. So we currently have RFID tags that are going in and out of 80 to 300 degree ovens. Um, and then we have other ones that are being wiped daily with very, you know, abrasive solvents and stuff like that to keep them clean. Um, and then finally is, you know, we utilize technology very like very uh, very much like the, the the handheld device that the girl has in the photo there, that it's able to pick up 700 tags a second. So, you know, in terms of the efficiencies and the time savings you gain by utilizing RFID, rather than having to touch every single asset and scan the barcode on it, you can walk into a room or 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 somewhere and and 
read 700 assets and get information on 700 assets or log information on 700 assets a second. Um, so I'll not talk through all the points there, but you know, you can, you'll be able to read through the slides. Um, so what do we currently do in terms of, you know, what are our capabilities and how they align to, to what's coming with digital product passport? Um, so I suppose at our core is tracking asset movement. So um, I've mentioned RFID. We use other technologies like BLE, which is Bluetooth, or GPS, um, to to track those those assets throughout either you know a life cycle in terms of production or just a general you know the full life cycle of a product. Um, now apart from being able to you know immediately put your hands on that asset when you need it, so that that immediate benefit of of knowing where something is, um, you know that aligns well with the digital product passport and being able to give that end to end traceability of an asset. As well as that, we can track usage. And by that, I mean, it could be electricity usage of a particular uh, production line or building or, you know, gas usage of a building. And um, so we give you that extra metric that you can potentially, you know, base consumption um, metrics off, such as, you know, if I make 10,000 uh, products um, this month, I can compare that against my usage for that month. And I can very quickly calculate, um, you know, a metric in terms of kilowatt hours per device or per asset created. Um, as well as that, you know, if we are tracking the location of the asset, um, and we are tracking the usage of that location. It kind of gives us that unique ability to be able to pair those two metrics together and understand that you know that asset was in that place and that place consumed this amount of uh, energy. Um, and that allows us again the, the digital product passport. Um, the 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 particulars haven't been nailed down yet, but it allows us to you know pair that up and give it that stamp for when the digital product passport comes in, and um, you know we can record that information. Similarly, we can track the environmental conditions um, of where assets are um, or just, you know, of a location. So uh, I suppose there's two main, two main parts to this. You know, there are assets out there and there are production lines out there um, that need to be created um, in a particular environment. So whether that is, you know, a temperature threshold or a humidity threshold, or if an environment needs to be very clean, you know, particulate matter would need to be low. Um, and again, being able to pair that with the location of the asset so we know where the asset is at that time and we know what the environment is in that location being able to pair that up can provide really valuable information that can you know be queried later and, and i'll take you through a bit of that as well as that though there you, you know there's some ethical considerations here you know was my was my product made in a safe and comfortable environment for the workers um, as I say, the, the, they haven't been nailed down, but the, I can see that being a very valuable part of the digital part of passport moving forward. Finally, obviously, you know, we, we are um, we're, we're capturing all this data for the digital product passport, but that doesn't mean it has to be stored away and, and, and um, you know, not looked at. The reality is if you are capturing this data, um, you can use it now as well as provide that data to the digital product passport. So I'll take you through how, you know, potential operational efficiencies and changes can be made now. So you're getting that benefit now as well as preparing yourself for the legislation coming. So Joanne mentioned Craig Concrete, and this is a bit of a proof of concept we put together for them <clears throat> to track things that very closely align with the digital product passport. So we can see here two clear, uh, distinct kind of parts where we have production metrics, and that tells us things about you know the date that, that 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 particular panel was manufactured across the top we have three metrics which we could you know potentially ingest from the customer or you know calculate so the amount of concrete used that could come from some sort of uh third party uh solution that that, that credit have and um, we can then calculate maybe an estimate for CO2 produced for that concrete. And then we can either ingest information from some sort of electricity provider or indeed as I mentioned add uh, electricity sensors to to understand what sort of electricity they're using then these other metrics um in the production they are the environment on the date of production so crea in 10 or 15 years uh, can go back and look at what was the what was the environment like that that particular asset was made in could that have an impact on um 
you know, why a particular lifespan of a product was, was shortened or, and things like that. And that it just provides that valuable information to ensure that they're providing the products in, in the correct way. The second part here then is a storage metric. So um, obviously if we're tracking where the product is, we can tell you exactly where it is so that you can go and get it and, and ship it out to the customer. But we can also tell you things like how long has it been in storage and what way was it stored? Um, so by having a, a sensor on the on the um, asset that allows us to track temperature and humidity of the asset, we can alert on things if there has been a temperature threshold break that maybe means a, you know, a, a colleague needs to check that asset before it ships to a customer or we may need to remake the product. While we're gathering this information about the assets, you can, as I say, you can start to make these operational changes. This is a this is an example of how data could be used to potentially identify a particular anomaly in terms of the curing stages of of the concrete. So we can see here we have six panels that um, seem to follow a normal curing cycle pretty evenly, but we have one that um, followed a completely different curing cycle and might not be ready for demolding. So. This allow, this data allows me to go and investigate why this is. Is there a change in the mix? Is that something I should be picking up on? Or is this a particularly cold part of the factory and, and stuff like that? So having this data obviously is great for the digital product passport and the legislation is coming, but it allows you to kind of make some operational changes now. So where do we align right now with K-Track? So as you can see here, we have a lot of detail about an asset, and this is the asset screen and um, the asset description, the asset details screen that we have. And um, so we can assign friendly names and unique names, um, you know, for that uh, particular asset. But as you can see, just uh, the second one up from the bottom there, we have that field for the GIAI as Rachel um, described. So at our core is that GS1 um, identifier and that unique, identif unique identifier for that product. We can include other unique references and, you know, equipment types and things like that. And then here are the other metrics that I was that I was talking about. So whether we're ingesting that CO two or calculating that CO two, you know we're talking we're talking about the particulate matter on the date of manufacture. We could ingest things like the repairability index score, which is coming with the digital product passport. And again, these are CO two levels at the time of production and humidity levels and all that sort of stuff. And that that's where that's where KTrack is right now, ready to be utilized for that data ingestion and that data visualization. And um, now and to you know, essentially ease the pain of that move to the digital product passport. And I will hand back over to Joanne for this slide. Can I just, can I just jump yes. in one, one yep. question just before that? So obviously every industry, every business is going to be different. You know, so yep. you described the, the create concrete one, which is very specific and it, you know, and you described even, uh, which I didn't know in terms of the different RFID type, you know, technology you can use it you can abrase it and heat it and all that sort of good stuff so that's obviously came a long way from what i kind of knew but how would a how would a customer decide on the best technology to use for their specific operation because you, you know you don't know what you don't know so how, how would you even begin to start with that i suppose that there's lots of different companies do it in lots of different ways but at kinsetsu we provide that pre-sales um function which, you know, essentially I lead that in terms of abstracting all that complexity away from a customer. Um, and it just allows the customer to focus on the the outcomes that they're wanting to see. So whether that is that those operational efficiencies now or the DPP preparation, um, that's all they should have to worry about when they come to Kinsetsu because I'm the one in the background putting all the building blocks together to, to build the solution that, that will meet those outcomes. Right. Um, now I can't speak for other companies, but that's what we do. <laughs> oh, no, that sounds, yeah, yeah, it's it's the what, not the how. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's yeah. Perfect. yeah. And David, right. from that perspective, you know, if you are have, using GS1 standards and a GS1 member, then you know, we would advise and support the best solution to be able to do that tracking and tracing or identification for the products. So, um, and then that's where partners like um can set you obviously help and play that part we can obviously then advise and they can advise and support of how they can work with us brilliant 
No, thanks, folks. That's perfect. Sorry, Joanne, I've cut across you there a little. No, no, it's a, it a good question. Um, yes, I think just to finish off, you know, we, we've been very fortunate and have been supported by Smart Manufacturing Data Hub um, and the whole Made Smarter team on, on, on this project. So, it, you know, Concepti are a lighthouse in the UK, which is enabling us to bring this technology um, into a customer's environment at a much reduced cost to help reduce uh, the risk uh, and looking at this technology and, and looking at it from an innovation perspective, but also to ensure the viability and the value of what would be, um, you know, captured from the various different elements that we've talked here about in relation to, to data, you know, in relation to understanding something from the very, very start of a process, smart inventory, right the whole way through process and even into transport as well. But but this particular, um, you know, offer for, for from ourselves, um, which is supported by Smart Manufacturing Data Hub, is the ability to bring in um, location tracking um, into your facility, um, either using the higher value um, as, uh, asset tracking um, BLE um, devices or utilizing RFID, which is a lower kind of cost um, in relation to that. Um, and being able to, as Tom talked about there, whether we are putting information from di different sources, but, but for this particular project, we would actually be implementing um, an energy sensor um, and also uh, um, implementing an air quality sensor um, and an environmental sensor within one of those zones as well. So we're able to capture all of the elements of data that we've talked about um, in relation to helping get that visualization to see if there are any blockages or any improvements in process flow and visibility, um, but also then start to understand that data in conjunction with the customer um, around what would I want to capture and what would I want to know for my own business and my own net zero reporting, never mind ESG and digital product passport, um, but also then what might be um, relevant to how we could utilize some of this data and get ahead of the curve, ahead of the competition, um, you know, which and what's coming down the line. So um you know, we're we're delighted to be already kind of like at max on that from from a customer perspective, but we've ex decided to extend that um, a little bit as well, just to support some additional customers coming on board. So that's a good point. Joanne. Somebody actually sent a message to me directly rather than then. So I think they're looking for competitive advantage. But <laughs> what they were actually asking was, you know, how many spaces are available and what are the timelines? Is, is, it, is it going to cut off? Is this like you have to, when do you have to sign up? I know a lot of these schemes are, you know, there's a sort of a hard line that you've got to be on board by. So just a little bit of... Yeah, Um. so for that first cohort, I mean, we, we've we completed that. That was that had to be done really in September and October. So we're onboarding all of those customers now. Um, and they're all from diverse industries, you know, defence, healthcare, um, construction, um, wood products, metal products, lots of different things as well. So, but for us, we're going to extend that out to another six clients. It's just been so beneficial. And actually, I must say, it's a partnership with these customers because we put what the customer wants to see at the center. We talk about human center design and what output and what outcome do they want from the data. Um, and it's just been brilliant, I suppose, some of the conversation we've already had. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, but it, it, the timeline is, now, really, you know, over the next month, we need, really need people to be onboarding um, November and starting to generate that data um, for analysis in really December and January. Like it, it stops in January. Um, our P POCs run for six months, um, but the kind of data analysis piece for um, Innovate UK stops in January, effectively. So the sooner the better. Talk to people in terms of qualifying for the support, you can talk them through that process very quickly to see whether they qualify or not, I guess. Yes, yes, absolutely. We'll be delighted to talk to anybody individually after yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Guys, I cannot believe it. I mean, you're literally finished on time. I mean, well done. So good uh, at this. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, top professionals, what can I say? Well, look, is there any any closing points do you think at this stage, guys? Any sort of final takeaways before we, we finish off? Well, for me, it's just all around, um, you know, we need to be thinking about working in one common common way. So um, NGS1 standards is is a unique identification. It is um, what we're expecting industry. Why why reinvent the wheel in construction when we're already doing it in retail healthcare uh, elsewhere? This is what we should be thinking and we should be using these identifications, keys throughout the, the rest of it. Perfect. 
Yeah, yeah. And I think just in the same way as Consent, so you have a strong partnership with GS1. We also have that approach um, with our with our customers, I think. And um, I think that's just really important that, you know, and Tom does take away the pain. But I think from the customer, just that little bit of time at the start of any of these projects to say, listen, this is this is my vision. This is what I would like you to you yeah. to bring to me and to visualize for me and to help me understand in my environment. Um, and, and, and it's not an onerous task, to be fair, you know, so uh Tom's no, the look at the, 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 the collaboration. Time. It's clear. I mean, it, it, and it seems there's a lot, even you know, the sort of external support in terms of funding. You know, GS1, and then you guys at a practical level actually out with clients delivering those solutions. It's a, it's a you know, it's a dream team. So look, well done, guys. There's another session coming, obviously. So this is session two um, or, or on the series sort of thing. So um, it will be available to so anybody who hasn't. Or, or, or wants to get access, the, the slides will be available, obviously, in a day or two, I guess, uh, uh, on demand on, on, on the site. So, look, thanks very much for your time, folks. Well, thank you. We'll leave it there. And thank thanks you. for joining, everyone. It's been thank a great you, yes. morning session. Thank you.